I'm Blake Hargreaves. Welcome to Future Stops. You're hearing music by the Belgian improvisational music entity known as Rosin. The group is an evolving collection of musicians led by the two founding members, Brecht Emile and Kim Delcourt. These sonic seekers join forces over a shared interest in ancient music, ancient instruments, and a taste for harnessing the special acoustics of sacred spaces, resulting in music that is both mysterious and enchanting. We began playing together like a good 10 years ago. We've continued to do our work together, our exploration of certain intonations and timbres and uh, our preferences. And mostly I play the string instruments in the ensemble. And when we play in a, in a church and there's an organ, I'm the organist. And Kim is our uh, recorder and reeds uh, specialist. I play all of the wind instruments. Um, when I was at, I think the last year at the conservatory in Brussels here, where, where I studied uh, classical guitar, a little bit of Baroque lute, I, I wanted to explore um, the, the common ground between certain aspects from early music and ritual ethnic music uh, through improvisation. And I was looking for someone who could, could play the bagpipe and improvise on it. And uh, someone indicated me that Kim was the right person to do that. And I remembered his name and I thought, okay, let's see how that goes. And I think like a good six months after that, uh, that his name was dropped, we, we met. And I asked him to join in an improvisation and it grew from there. And I think that shortly after that, we had the first uh, concert here in Brussels and the first split LP in 2010. Yeah, from the first improvisation session that it felt really natural. So some of the first recordings of the first improvisation went on that first record yeah, true. already. True. So yeah. it was from the first uh, clear that uh, it was a, a good match uh, and an easy, easy going uh, improvisation. What kind of music were you making before on the bagpipes and on the organ? Okay, me me personally, I, I grew up with bagpipe and with traditional traditional Flemish and Frank, French uh, folk music. I was studying recorder at the Conservatory of Brussels, so Baroque and Renaissance music, but I specialized in contemporary classic uh, music on recorder. And just before I met Brecht, I was doing an album with all sort of, of medieval scales on drones. So, and meeting Brecht, that was just a further setting, um, continuation, a continuation uh, of, of, of that exploration for me. So, I'm, I'm, I came from traditional folk and Baroque and Renaissance music. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm a string performer or a string uh, player. I, I play uh, various uh, string instruments. But the, the thing that attracted me to the organ, I think, to be honest, it might have been also in the same period where I started this idea of this group. I had a course about intonation and temperament that was part of the early music department. And that course introduced me to um, certain organ tunings. And of course, I was aware of, um, of, of various intonations and so on, and I was already deeply receptive to the field of overtones and the way you could approach music differently. But then in, in that course, I discovered the, the, the richness and also the incredible craft that people had in Renaissance, Renaissance times, for example. And I think that was the first, um, the first point to attract me to um, discovering uh, organs and performing on them. So you were just talking about the first improvisation that that ended up uh, you ended up um, publishing, and um, as you've worked in improvisation, how do you decide the instrumentation? The decision of which instrument we we play 
we decide in the room if we play mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the church or if we play in in a, in a, on a small venue or then we this when then we decide what would fit best in 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 that um in that acoustic place you know for example if we play in a church with a beautiful organ then we decide to play the organ and it depends on the tuning and the intonation of the organ <laughs> which instruments mm -hmm. go with it exactly yeah. for example um a bagpipe in a church is fantastic mm -hmm. in combination with organ but if the organ is tuned too high which is often often the case in old organs then i cannot play with bagpipe in that tuning or in that on that pitch uh, so i decide to I, i have to go to other instruments so it's um the decision of instruments is really on the spot Yeah. And depending on the place and the acoustic uh, space. Exactly. We, we never play with two, the two of us. We always invite uh, friends. For example, there is a double bass player who plays Sarangi as well. There is an electronica guy. There is a hurdy-gurdy player. Uh, there is a guy who, who plays um, historical clarinets. So depending on how many guests and which guests are playing along, we choose also uh, our color. We have been really strict in, in choosing the right people to en enter our sound world. And I think they have to be, um, they have, they really ha need to have a uh, sort of skill set, both on a sort of spiritual level and a level as musician. And it only works if this is completely right. So I think they have to understand that it, they have to play without ego and just let the music di dictate where it goes. But they have to be able to improvise in that setting or in a certain unusual tuning or just to be able to adapt to whatever is... Let's say that our whole philosophy is like the music will decide where it goes. For example, if you use the recorder, it's going to be the recorder who decides what color is, is right for a, a certain song. If we work from the organ, then it's the organ that's going to decide it. And I don't think that all musicians are able to go with that sort of process. Speaking of the pipe organ, bringing that instrument into your context, uh, the organ brings with it quite a, a complex context. Um, how how do you integrate it into your sound? I think that's maybe the same way as, um, as, as the recorder or the bagpipe might be uh, functioning as a sort of a central character in the narrative we are approaching and then um, we always try to find what in what way does this instrument sound best or in what way does this instrument blend really blend very well with with the people who are at the moment moment present so the moments where we have a chance to work with an organ the first thing we'll do is that we'll just go and check the organ and and the various possibilities and we're going to decide in the room again what works best and what could be for example for example we might discover that a certain organ in a church has a sort of um, um, let's say um, a fault in one of the pipes which gives that a certain ground tone is a bit out of tune but that this really works well with one of Kim's bagpipes I'm just giving an example then we'll try to work with that for example So it's, um, it's, it's never on the basis of technique or on the basis of we have this scale that we want to use. It'll be always the surroundings and the instrument itself that will lead us to certain discoveries or to certain choices. Or, for example, there is a certain tonality that reverbs in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, there are spaces who are reverbing the A, Um, much more than the F, for example. Mm -hmm. So then we will use very much A uh, to have to have just that, that resonance and that reverberance uh, of of of, the, of that church. But that's very specific on the spots. 
The way Rosin maps the unique resonant characteristics of a church to shape their sound and instrumentation when recording, in many ways resembles the intricate process of designing a pipe organ for such a space. The instrument is carefully voiced to make the best of the acoustical chamber in which it speaks and resonates. To play an organ that is built for a specific church, to hear it in that specific church, mm -hmm. it's impressive. It's um, um, it dwings you tot. Um, it forces you to. It forces you to to be humble and, and to be focused. You know, it it can, it can be deadly silent in a church. Mm -hmm. There is a kind of kind of um, atmosphere or something, and that organ pierces through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that my my love for the organ is the similar love I have for the recorders, such as Kim plays, is that they can, um, the, a, a good organ, it, it combines the most humanistic element with the most alien element. It, it can be really um, giving you like a sort of warmth and solace and comfort. It can sound really human or really recognizable. But it can have a really um, other side or alien side or just a almost pure sine, sine wave aspect or a strange tuning that, that we're not used to anymore. So I, I think a, a large appeal for me for um, trying to find my way on, on certain organs is because of it, it has this combination. And I think that, an for example, an, ex an instrument like the violin doesn't have this for me. The fact that you have a really, really humane element with a lot of crafts and knowledge behind it and a really still very fascinating and alienating and strange aspect as well. The humane elements of an organ and the otherworldly alien sounds it can produce contrast on Razin's 2014 album Remote Hologram, pairing the pipe organ with unusual medieval and renaissance instruments and the 1920s electronic oddity on de Martineau. Well, uh, this album was recorded uh, partly in a really small chapel in the surroundings of Brussels. It's a chapel that uh, Kim had discovered in some way, and he was aware of uh, the acoustics there. And he, at one point he said, like, let's try and do a recording in that space. And um, we, we, had, we then, he, he, Kim knew a guy who had been specialized in um, in recording and, and not really recording solely, but also in discovering um, architectural vibrations. And so we had this guy who already was in his 60s or 70s. He had this kind of a, a Brille and Care specific instrument that he used formerly to record vibrations. A kind of microphone. Yeah, it's like to, for measuring. Yeah, actually, indeed, a sort of measuring device but that you could use to record or to um, to see what it gave and we recorded in the chapel with with this device not, not a real microphone but a sort of technical instrument formerly used to capture vibrations and to measure and calibrate uh, rooms and and that that for us was like um, a sort of natural way of, of dealing with our own intuitive approach to what should music be and how should music interact with uh, with the surroundings and um, and acoustics of a space okay and in in a complex acoustic do you find that what you hear while you're performing uh is different from what gets recorded we try to put the microphones in that way mm -hmm. that uh in the recordings you hear the space and the acoustic environment as well so we try to to give the listener the full the full uh experience the church experience so it's a question of using the right microphones mm -hmm. and putting them in a good place in the church not too close uh by the instruments but you know somewhere in the middle or combining microphones um, very, very uh, dicht bij, um, nearby, nearby yeah, the instrument, yeah, yeah. and very, and very far as well. The, 
that there's never like a golden rule. It's it always has to. I think when we do church recordings, half the time is occupied by just finding the, the right places to put everyone to check how how we'll record, and we we tend to give some care to that and and not have like a prefixed idea of it should be like this, but just enter almost blankly into the space and then be be receptive where it leads us. Um, let's talk a bit about um, the meaning of uh, making music inside a church, music which has no direct religious um, connotation, like no religious lyrics in it, but at the same time it doesn't have any connotation that necessarily separates it from uh, religion or spirituality. What's the meaning, um, what's the metaphysical meaning of your music? It's, we're not religious, but uh, when we play music and when we improvise, it's very spiritual because we tend to be in a group, you know, we, we, we tend to be one, one breathing being or something. We're very much, we're very focused and we're extremely in the here and now without ego. So without being religious, it's, it's quite uh, s spiritual what we're doing. And of course, listening very much to each other and listening very much to what the church or the space gives back is, 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 is really uh, important. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a prayer or something, mm -hmm. but not in a religious way. It's, it's kind of, of a deep, deep focus, but not, uh, talking to, to some kind of God or, or something who, or someone who, who is, who has deceased or something, but some kind of, of, uh, you could say it's kind of a way of, of putting your question to the cosmos out there without expecting to get an answer back. And doing this through letting the instruments speak out what they are doing good at. And what, what, what we're also thinking, what, what is also maybe a spiritual aspect is that we are just capturing what is there. We don't play instruments, we are the instrument. So it's through us that that is that the cosmos is sounding or something or, or that that the environment is uh, is audible. So if you're channeling the energy uh, through the instruments, uh, do you feel that what comes out is different than it might be if you were playing in a community center or in a bar? Of course, totally different, because. Because the environment, the occasion, uh, the, 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 the atmosphere is, is really different. Huh? So we, we interact very much with, with the moment and the place. With the here and now. And I think there is also, there is an importance of um, the sort of um, oral tradition in churches and the way the acoustics are built to let, a, let the voice be really clear or be impressive. For example, we discovered that very often if you have a bit of a larger church and you have the place where the pulpit is, that, that, that for example, if Kim picks up his uh, shawm, you know what a shawm is? Yes, a uh, medieval reed instrument. Exactly. That if, we, if he will be with, with this instrument like the shawm or the bagpipe, where the pulpit is, it will, it will sound extra impressive or extra strong or, there, or there's definitely a clear choice of where the pulpit was was built to have a um, maximalized effect in acoustic terms because also above there is sort of roof mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who, who uh, pr projects the sound exactly towards towards the audience and so i think uh, very often churches are there with the with the, with the visual, or well, people are, are aware of the way that the visual aspect of the church is there to, to bring, or to, to impress or bring a certain effect, but the acoustic effect is always also there. 
The acoustic effect on remote hologram is haunting, intimate, and at times unsettling, reflecting the small intimate space where it was recorded. Their 2019 album, Aik Adista Adista Aik, finds the group in a very different kind of space with a setup they've never encountered. That's that that's a proper church organ. Mm-hmm. Uh, that particular church is really big. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the interesting uh, thing on that organ is that it was not above, mm-hmm. but it was on the ground. So we could play sitting just around around me as an organ player, yeah. which was a first, but because mostly the organ tends to be far away or up in the air and there's no communication visually, only the ears, as you said. But this place, like the central place of where the organ is, is like a hexagonal space, really strange inside the church. And so the, the keyboard and the organ itself are on the ground. So that was uh, really special to be able to play there. And a good organ, indeed. And, and this kind of organ brought along that these possibilities were there. Because we, we, we could see each other playing, yes. so we could interact more directly. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that was quite a specific, uh, yeah. that was quite specific there. And in the new record, um, I'm sorry, the Ayik Adista record, you have this concept of um, uh, the journey from light to dark. Can you tell us a bit about how people would hear that in the music or how it influences the music? Well, the the album starts uh, when the evening is falling and it's about... Um, well, 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 let's say that, that um, it's what we try to express is, is both the um, sort of um, universal feeling of... Um, being a bit afraid for the unknown and and the way that the uh, fear of the night has always been present in many cultures and people try to adapt to this kind of thing. So what the music is, I think, trying to do or doing is that we're evolving from the moment where the day is almost uh, gone by and, and when indeed evening or night is setting in. And then you have, you have to really um, make your passage through the darkness or through um, through the night, with with the ghosts and and with the night elements and and with the night animals uh, that you're scared of, and 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 the the album uh, ends with the first sun rays.
You're listening to the Future Stops podcast, an initiative of the Royal Canadian College of Organists. My name is Blake Hargreaves, and I'm your host as we explore the world of the 21st century organ. We just heard today's feature piece, Adista Aik II, from Razan's album Aik Adista Adista Aik, on the crack label out of Belgium. We're speaking with the core duo behind Rosin about their unique approach to acoustics, improvised music, and the pipe organ. The group has been lucky enough to work through the pandemic without breaking their stride and have multiple new releases coming out. Uh, maybe I should say that we, we, we don't rehearse. So Rosin as a group is a non-rehearsal group. We either, Kim and I, get together to just discuss books we've read or films we've seen and the ways it could lead to us doing some stuff. And and then we record or we play live. And I think we have a couple of live dates in the coming weeks, months. We just had an album out, not in a church, but in a very small dry space where we played with um, with the serpent. And I play and I play harmonium, which is like the household organ or whatever you could call it. And Kim focused on on recorders, so no double reads on this uh, this album, only bass recorder uh, Shalomo. Mm-hmm. kind of recorders mm-hmm. so it's a bit even again the surroundings there brought us to a more like um, intimate very intimate like the, a single person in a room or a single person in the, in, a, in an empty house that kind of atmosphere and the next album will be coming out in canada it's an album again split in different surroundings but the main focus is um reeds and harmonium but with the addition of um, of uh, our friend uh, Will Will Guthrie on percussion, and there is one more uh, album coming. Yes, and that is for later, hopefully before summer or in summer. We think yeah. 2022. And and it is a, a really a church organ album. Mm-hmm. It's recorded um, in Leuven in a big big church with an organ from 1692 with a very specific uh, tuning and a very, very specific pitch. Yeah, it's a mean tone temperament tuning and the pitch was 392 or something no, like that. 396. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So we really adapted everything to the very small organ because it had really a very small keyboard. That was quite a challenge, but I think we we found some, some nice things there and that will be out on the American uh, important records, I think around summer. Listening to their music, we can go on a journey with Razan, imagining ourselves alongside them while they begin the recording process by mapping the acoustical nature of the space they want to work in. They collaborate with the resonant frequencies and tones. It's how they decide on a tuning system in which to work and choose their instrumentation. Every performing musician collaborates with the space in which they play, and this is especially true for organists. Razan's dedication and care to harmonizing with their environment is a great lesson for musicians, and the results are mesmerizing. We'd like to thank Kim Delcour and Brecht Emile of Razan for joining us today. We'd love it if you would join us too on social media at Future Stops and Future Stops Podcast, where you can bring your voice to the conversation. Future Stops is a podcast from the Royal Canadian College of Organists, Produced by Andrew O'Connor with Haley Raymond as community manager and executive producer Elizabeth Shannon. I'm your host, Blake Hargreaves.